let them slide. I said, I, maybe I'd rather repeat that. Oftentimes, when I go to activists or other meetings, we kill the person who's there and ignore the person who's not there. In other words, we treat the person who's not here better than we treat the person that actually came. Now, I'm not asking you to be soft, but I'm asking you to be considerate. And I'm asking you to respect the fact that he came. Now, that may mean something, may not. Uh, First and foremost, colleges need to get more African American males in their law schools because there is a fraction of the students who, who fit that category. And then the dilemma is when the county kind of prosecutor's office hired them, the U.S. Attorney's office pays about thirty thousand dollars more or forty thousand dollars more, and then they're swiped immediately. Once they get six months' experience, a year experience, the reality is they're gone. But I think to me, it starts in getting more African American males. It, certainly, we need Hispanics, we need African American females, but there is a real, real need for African American males. I don't know what the percentage of African American males in the system, but it's certainly the largest category of individuals. In, I think, as a community, we need to strive to increase that number. And I think it starts with going to our law schools, meeting with the deans of those law schools, and telling them especially the state law schools, who are all getting state tax dollars to be around, that we need to push them and, and push their diversity requirements so that... But I can tell you the dilemma with the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office, there's certainly not enough African-American male assistant Cuyahoga County Prosecutors. Yes. Period. Period. And I can tell you, during that time with uh, Prosecutor McGinty, I didn't really know him. I knew of him. But I... It was clear to me that his leadership style did not fit what I think the residents of this county expect in a Cuyahoga County prosecutor. As you may or may not know, four years ago, Prosecutor Rudigitti was elected with 35% of the vote. That means two out of every three voters believed it was a better candidate. And I think it's incumbent upon an elected official, and in particular one who only had a third of the vote, that you get out to the community and you build bridges to show people who you are and what you're about, and by doing so, you know they 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 get confidence in your leadership, and they know who you are. But prosecutor, they lock in and no way they can go. It's just what they did up there was crazy. Okay. In fact, that no one is going. Uh, to get it. Okay, go ahead. And I'll just say this: is to okay. who should have been charged. I was not in the grand jury. I, I can't speak to all the evidence the prosecutor had, but I can see the evidence that I saw. And that's what I think all of us can see is what we saw from the pictures. And I can tell you this, that every case, whether it's that case or the Rice case or any other grand jury case, every case should be handled in a consistent way, period. No matter who the victims are or who the perpetrators are, you need consistency. They say the mark of a good judge is a judge that's consistent, that is not erratic from case to case. And the same thing goes true for a county prosecutor. You need people to present cases fairly and impartially and let the chips fall where they may. Now, I was not in the grand jury when, those, when that case was presented, so I can tell you this. I'm talking about the Brillo case now. I'm talking about the Brillo case. Uh, no, I'm talking about the Brillo I'm talking about the other 12 shooters that were never in that. Right, right. That's and, what I want you to respond to. And, and I can tell you this, that all of the actions of each individual should have been presented to the grand jury in a fair and impartial manner. And I think what we saw in the Rice case was uh, fair and impartiality in the opposite direction. So I can tell you this, that all actions by any individual involved should have been fairly and impartially presented to the grand jury, and that grand jury should have been allowed to consider all charges against anybody involved and make the determination whether there was probable cause to believe a crime occurred. And if there was probable cause to believe a crime occurred, then people should have been charged accordingly. So I can't tell you what each individual did, because obviously there was a lot of people involved. My recollection there was 50 or 100 cars in the pursuit and multiple people who were shooting, but they all should, every action of everybody involved should have been heard of that fairly to the, the grand jury and the chief should have been allowed to fall fairly and impartially so that justice was, was pursued in a manner that people have confidence in the system. <clears throat> and I can tell you that 
every day an individual is incarcerated unjustly is a day that you can never make up to that individual. And you know, I think about my own life, and you know, the days when I go my fly by. I can't imagine being incarcerated for that long unfairly and unjustly. So I think when there's valid <clears throat> submissions that you have an extremely high duty to promptly and fairly give that case a review, hear from the parties involved, <clears throat> review that case file, and, and I can tell you, as Joe was a councilman and I was a councilman, you need to be responsive to people. And if you're not responsive, you don't have a job. That's wrong. And when things, when things go on for eight or 10 months, and even though she calls weekly, <clears throat> she does not hear anything back, I know as a councilman in the old broken area, I would run out of office. Because people deserve a call back. Even if they call back and say, you know what? We're doing this, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this. And we're at this stage right now, you need to give people feedback. If you go there, you'll see there are 24 pages of um, cases that have been over a year just sitting. And what I want to know is, you say justice delayed, justice denied. What are the specifics that you will bring to the table for your team to implement change? in terms of making sure we get the manner, addressing the issue, and as, as the Northeast Media Group regularly says about them, pick up the phone and talk to somebody. You don't need to, to shoot a, a mortar at them. And I can tell you, because of his strained relationship with the court, it put the normal room, day-to-day -day general felony prosecutors in a very bad situation because you had a, judge, a court of 34 judges who are oftentimes very disappointed and angry at the prosecutor's office because they couldn't, they didn't like his method of handling things. So I would have to routinely call those judges up and say, hey, you couldn't control him when he's one of your colleagues. Do you think these second and third year kids out of law school can stop him from throwing hand grenades? <clears throat> the answer is no. So I have the ability to work with people. If there's an issue on a case pending too long, I'm not going to throw a hand grenade. I'm going to pick up the phone and say, and talk with both the defense counsel and the judge on the phone and say, we need <clears throat> to get the case moving. I don't need to do it on the front page of all due respect to Cleveland.com. <laughs> Issues can be handled in a manner that are fair and equitable and they get the point without burning people down. That this I'm county and this state do everything within its power to keep homeowners in their homes. And this, this city because I'm a Cleveland resident as well, in this county has seen damage because of that foreclosure crisis that drove down the value of everybody's homes. I know anybody in my neighborhood has seen it. I'm sure they've seen it in the Lee Harbor neighborhood as well. But that bank manipulated somehow the foreclosure crisis that had all occurred has done nothing but take equity out of all of our homes. And meanwhile, the banks were given billions and billions of dollars to bail them out. You know, John Q. Citizen, the public, hasn't been made whole either. Do it is work. And as you enforce the banks to the table and keep people in their homes, and in much as the government gave them billions of dollars to bail them out of their hole, they need to work with the homeowners to keep them in their houses because it's it's having a devastating impact on all of us. I heard you make a statement almost maybe three and a half weeks ago about the time limit being too long for Tamir Rice. And my question is, what would you be able to do to make sure in your role that you can speed up the process? What can you do? Well, I, I can tell you this, and going back to the whole issue, is that the rice issue was too long. As, as I'm sure many of the women here know, you know, Anthony Soul was indicted in 30 days. 11, 11 homicides, a very complex crime scene. He was indicted in 30 days. How does the rights take 13 or 14 months? It, it doesn't make any sense. And I think, what, in my belief, what happened, I think his intention was to, this is just speculation, but I believe probably his intention is that right now said Anthony Soul was indicted in a month. There is no reason that that case should have taken that long. But again, my goal, and I think, like I said, we're at a unique time in history. My goal. Santa Williams has a bipartisan bill pending in Columbus. 
where she's got a Republican sponsor. Sir, you can't get anything done with down there without the Republicans helping you. 30 seconds. That, that people, we can get it done at this point in history where we have the independent individual come in and conduct the investigation. Then we don't have to worry about people dragging it out to the his interaction with, with the residents. And as a county prosecutor, as I indicated, yeah. it's incumbent upon the prosecutor to get out and build confidence with his leadership. And, you know, there's always going to be tough cases that come down the pike, but by being out in the neighborhood, by being at events like this, um, that people learn who you are and what you're about, and they get a feel for what the type of person you are as a human being. Period. And we all learn, every day in life we learn that. We, you meet people, you, you develop a relationship, and you say, you know what? He's not a bad guy or a bad girl. I think they're fair. And, and that's what you need to do. You can't hide in the Justice Center and expect anybody to, you can't, you can't earn respect that way. And I can tell you that when I am elected on March 15th, <coughs> It will not be the last time you see me here. It will not be the last time the Imperial Women see me. It will not be the last time the Black Women's Political Action Committee sees me. They're going to know who Michael Malley is. They're going to respect who Michael Malley is. They may not always agree with me, but they're going to know it's somebody who cares about and tries to do the right thing. And that's all you can ask for anybody standing in that position. The second part of Dr. Rice's question.